Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar in our series, Growing the Critical Zone Research Network. Um, this webinar is entitled Diversity, Inclusion, uh, and Access in the Critical Zone. I'm going to give everyone a second to log on and get connected. But please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Quasi website and YouTube channel following the presentation. There you can also find the previous webinars in this series, most recently dealing with change in the critical zone. Um, we welcome any questions you might have throughout the webinar and encourage you to ask them in the question and answer box below. The presenters will be able to address them directly after the webinar or throughout the webinar um, via chat. Once again, thank you for tuning in to this final installment of the 2020 Quasi Winter Webinar Series, Growing the Critical Zone Research Network. And with that, let's get started. I'll pass it off to Nicole, who can introduce herself and our first presenter. Nicole, you're muted. <laughs> No. All right. Welcome, everyone. I just gave a wonderful welcome um, that I will now repeat. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this webinar series. This is the last, as Julia said, in our series. If you missed any of our previous webinars, I encourage you to go to the Quasi website and to watch those. They're available um, to be watched anytime, as will this as well. If you want to see anything, um, if something catches your fancy and you don't get a chance to take notes on it, this webinar will be available. So this is part of a webinar series that um, five of us are running or organizing with the help of Quasi because we are part of an NSF funded research coordination network. And the goal of our research coordination network is to grow the critical zone research network. And we are tackling both expanding the network and expanding science questions. Okay, so our seminars, uh, the, four sem the four webinars that we've had were to introduce uh, concepts in critical zone science, and then also to introduce newcomers to critical zone science as to how they can get involved and in opportunities that are out there for um, participating in critical zone science. Um, and one of the goals that we have as part of our research coordination network is to really get new people into critical zone science and inspire the next generation of scientists and leaders um, that are really going to tackle and answer some really important questions in critical zone science. So you've all probably seen this before, but just a reminder, uh, the critical zone is defined as roughly the from the top top of the canopy, the zone from the top of the canopy to the base of groundwater, and it's where life and rock and um, vegetation and biota and all kinds of things that I don't understand even um, are interacting, okay? And this is, this is where we live, this is where we grow our food, and this is a critical thing that we need to preserve and understand um, as humans, okay? And in order to do this, we need to not just have disciplinary skills, but we need to talk to other disciplinary sciences and work across the boundaries in order to answer critical questions. So as part of our research coordination network, we have a number of things that we want to do, which is one, um, promote and develop new approaches to quantifying the critical zone system, um, explore interactions among chemical, mechanical, and biological processes, explore how the critical zone is changing changing within the Anthropocene, what is being accelerated, how our processes changing, um, look at processes across scales, and then most importantly today, we're thinking about how can we diversify the critical zone community so that we have as many brains and people power on this so that we can actually answer these questions. So these, pan these webinars, um, with today being the final one, are leading up and helping us shape a workshop that's going to be held from June 22nd to 25th at Colorado School of Mines. There's no registration fee and we can support travel. We really want early career people to apply. We want people from underrepresented groups and we're thinking about that broadly. Um, so we want you to apply 
If you are interested in getting involved in critical zone science, growing your network, finding mentors, learning about the science, please um, go to this website here and you have until April 1st to actually apply for our workshop. Okay. So today's panel is going to tackle diversity, equity, and inclusion within the critical zone. We have six panelists. We're really excited because our panelists are from across the spectrum in career stage and in locations where they're um, from, we have government to academic scientists and really across sort of the skill sets as well. So we have a really interesting view as to how we can diversify the critical zone. So with no further ado, and let me just remind everyone, if you have questions at any point within this webinar, please go to the Q&A button um, in your Zoom panel and you can ask questions there. And at the end of the uh, webinar, we will field questions. Um, and some questions may also be answered in writing um, throughout the webinar, but we'll also bring them up again at the end, okay? Um, so our first panelist today is Christina Keating from the University of Rutgers Newark, and I'm going to stop sharing and Christina, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right. All right, so um, I am going to talk a little bit about a program that I've been uh, developing with some other people to um, bring students from diverse groups into the geosciences by introducing them to geophysics in the critical zone context. And our program is newly named GNOMES, which stands for Geophysics um, of the Near Surface and Outdoor Motivational Experience for Students. Um, and I actually noticed just looking at the list of participants that we have some of the GNOME students participating today. So it's pretty awesome that they're here and hi. Um, so the program overview is what we're trying to do is bring more people and in particular students from underrepresented minorities into the geosciences by introducing them to um, geophysics in this critical zone context. So we bring these students in, they're primarily from two and four year colleges in the Northeast with high URM populations. Um, we introduce them to geophysics and then we try to connect them to the community of learners as well. So we get them talking to critical zone scientists. We get them talking to people with geosciences careers. Um, we get them involved in different scientific organizations um, as well. So this all takes place at two weeks during May. We hold it at the Susquehanna Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory. Um, and we have a, a few mentors that we train to teach the geophysics. So the students aren't just learning from professors, they're learning from their peers. And I think that really sort of helps um, cement a lot of the things that they're learning. Um, but they do a series of sort of geophysics rotations where they learn about the different geophysics methods and they apply those to a critical zone question. Um, and the questions that they're looking at they're all new for the year that we work with the students. So last year, one of the questions we asked was, what is the structure of solid flexion loads within the Garner run subcatchment of the, um, the Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory? So then the students take that knowledge that they learned through these rotation activities, they ask a new critical zone um, science question and define a new project themselves. And then they do the research on that project and do research presentations both on the, the rotation activities and their student-led project. And those um, presentations are given to the critical zone scientists at Penn State who are working in the areas that the students are studying as well. Um, so that is the way in which we connect these students to the scientific community. And then we support the students by doing a bunch of like team building exercises. We have a bunch of career talks, so we bring in people from a broad spectrum of geoscience careers, so from industry to academia to, um, to government to talk about their own career paths. Um, and then we do daily debriefings with the students and social activities. And then we follow up the program by having the students continue to do research on the data that they collected as they were participating in the program. Um, and they present that research at AGU in the fall. So, so far we've had, we've run the program for two years and we've had five different AGU presentations and it's been really great to sort of see these students present their, present the science at AGU. Um, so I work pretty closely with um, Greg and, and Jordan, I know Jordan's on this call as well, um, to do this, um, to, to run this program. Um, and the program is funded by NSF. 
But here are pictures and examples of the students actually doing the work. So the top two pictures are seismic um, tomography from um, and GPR data that were collected in Garner Run. The bottom is um, a, a, a supplemental activity that we did where we demonstrated some NMR measurements to the students. So the students um, could choose whether or not they wanted to learn about another geophysical method. And a lot of them chose to like come and learn more about geophysics, which is pretty cool. And then the last picture on the bottom is the students we took to AGU in 2019. The image on the very bottom is the way is a demonstration of the way in which the students research that they're doing at the site is actually getting connected to the broader scientific community. So this data that they collected, it's a seismic refraction tomogram, was incorporated into another graduate student from Penn State's presentation at AGO and into the research that she is writing up. That was um, Perry Silverheart, who is um, supervised by Roman DiBiase at Penn State. And then we do some assessment of the program as well. So we ask the students to kind of self-report how they feel like their skills in the geosciences have changed. And we specifically focus on geophysics skills. And the students self-report that through this program, they've made pretty big strides in understanding a lot of these geophysical concepts. We ask them to also ask them to think about how they picture themselves within the scientific community. And we ask them questions that are related to the persistence of students within STEM fields. And so our students show really, um, they show significant gains within all of these factors that affect persistence in STEM, STEM fields. So we're hoping that by bringing them here and introducing to these concepts, we're creating this community of students. And these students are really seeing how they themselves fit into the geosciences, how they fit into geosciences science careers and they bring that forward with them. And it's one thing for me to like talk about all of this um, and for you guys to sort of listen to the impact for me, but it's another to hear about it directly from a student. So I'm going to play a short video. The most valuable thing I've learned in this experience is that someone like me from my background could have a career in geophysics. Um, with the career talks and the field work, I've been able to really experience and learn a lot in a couple of days. And that's possible for someone from a low-income area, from a Hispanic background, that normally isn't exposed to these types of things. So I'm really excited to see where I go forward. Um, all right, so my next slide is about how you can get involved in the program. So this is an image of the students who participated last year. Um, and so if for any undergraduate students who are out there, our application deadline has not yet passed, unlike I think a lot of the other application deadlines for summer programs. Um, so our applications are due March 15th. If you're interested in applying, you can go to the website there. I'm sure the organizers will put it on the, um, the uh, webinar website as well. Um, I've also put out a list of REU programs. So NSF maintains a list of earth science related REU programs. These aren't CZO specific programs, but within each of the REU programs, there are CZO scientists working. So if you're interested in looking through those, finding someone to work with, um, then there is, there's a comprehensive list there. Um, I would also like to highlight the, RE, the Rutgers REU program. We host one here every year, so apply to work with me. Um, and the other thing you can do is just email professors. A lot of professors have funds to um, support student research that might not be advertised through like an REU program. So if you find a professor that you're very interested in, either on your campus or on other campuses, reach out to them. Um, I think for the most part, our professors are very interested to talk to anybody who is interested in their research. Um, then at last, as an undergrad, go to a conference and network with people and see all the stuff that is out there. Um, for graduate students, I would say present at conferences, try to present within um, CZ science um, sessions. So one of the sessions that I would like to highlight, of course, is a session that I organize, which is near surface geophysics in the critical zone. And then of course, attend small workshops and courses like the one associated with this webinar series. Um, and then finally, I think when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion, it's important to think, not just to put the onus on students who want to get involved, but also to put the onus on the people who are already involved in these communities. And so one of the things that I try to think about is how in my daily kind of practice of science, am I really trying to make this community diverse and inclusive? Um, and I think the first thing that I try to do is recognize and acknowledge that diversity is critical for excellence. And Nicole did a great job of like talking about this in the introduction slides to this topic. I also think we really need to talk about bias openly and authentically. So think about, you know, I think for the most part, we all think we're not biased, but we, um, but we have biases in our daily life that we just don't even know about. So talking about them, acknowledging them, and trying to address them as well. 
um, actively seeking out and making our research community more diverse in our collaborations, the undergraduate students we bring into our lab, the graduate students, I think part of the onus for that is also on the people who are making decisions about hiring. Um, and then I put in here practice self-reflection, which I think, you know, is just an important part of science. Um, so questioning how we're going about doing science is part of what we do as scientists. And I think it should be part of what we do when we're trying to create diverse communities as well. Um, and then finally, I've written here, read the, read the scientific literature about diversity and inclusion be, because um, we read the scientific literature about our science, and there's a lot of stuff out there that talks about best practices for diversity, inclusion, and equity within the sciences and also within the geosciences. And I think staying abreast of that is really helpful for making sure our community is diverse and inclusive. Um, and with that, I will pass it on. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, it was a great presentation. And I liked how you pointed out that um, there's a lot of ways that we can define diversity, which you had at the end, and that's really important to us. And I also want to emphasize that we would encourage undergraduates to apply to our workshop as well. Okay, Leho, I am going to hand this over to you. So our next speaker will be um, Alejandro or Leho Flores from Boise State. Great, awesome. <clears throat> thanks, Nicole, and thanks to the organizers. Can ever can you guys hear me? Your thumbs up from maybe Kamini or Nicole, awesome. So um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to present today. Um, so um, I wanna just kind of give a, a really brief introduction to um, who I am and, and, and the research that our group does. Um, we have, um, I, I run a, a, a group that, uh, our name is a backronym, so we picked LEAF um, and then um, named that the Lab for Eco-Hydrological Applications and Forecasting. Um, if I had to think of a motto for that group, um, we think about uh, and, and study people, water, and carbon through a computational lens. So we do a lot of, uh, a lot of land modeling um, and a lot of modeling in which we're trying to use models to understand how human perturbations impact things like the critical zone um, and will ultimately impact the, the ecosystem services on which um, the entire human population relies. Um, and, and we think about that in the context of, um, you know, not just the, the, you know, not just disturbances like climate change, but also disturbances that are sort of local in nature. And so as, as an example of this, um, you know, here's some work from one of my um, uh, current PhD students. This is funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, so this is work by Katie Mirren Beald in my lab. And um, the figure on the left shows um, an analysis in which Katie has, has gone and looked into and investigated um, the ways in which uh, commercial thinning and a variety of other um, silviculture practices in Idaho have changed over the last approximately 100 years. Um, and, and what she's looking at here is asking, looking at the, the evidence um, in terms of what the, what the National Forest Service has reported in terms of um, silviculture cuts in the forest and look at, looking at how those have changes, changed in responses to, for instance, policy changes. So the vertical lines that you see here indicate um, a variety of different environmental policies that were enacted that impacted silviculture in the forests. Um, and what, what we're asking, what we're trying to discern from the data is how did those policies actually influence the way that silviculture and forest management more broadly was done in these landscapes. Um, we can then, using advanced land models like the community land model, which is um, the land model in the uh, community earth system model, um, we can then um, basically use that data to develop more realistic scenarios about how land management actually occurs and and then playing that through the models try and understand the ways in which um, various ecohydrologic variables like above ground biomass soil moisture runoff but also um, key critical zone uh, properties like soil carbon would change in response to those different management regimes and so what we're really interested in is the intersection between how humans interact with the landscape and ultimately um, how those interactions, how human interventions ultimately are, are playing through and, and affecting the various um, ecosystem services on which we rely. 
So my next slide talks a little bit about, um, you know, so we were asked to, to provide um, a little bit of reflection in terms of how we are uh, seeking to help grow the critical zone research network. Um, and I want to talk about this from a couple of different roles that 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 I play um, in my program here. And um, some of this, I think, dovetails very nicely with what Christina just um, just presented. So in one of my capacities um, here at Boise State, I'm the graduate program coordinator for um, the PhD in geosciences in, in and the master's in hydrologic sciences. Um, and I am the chair of the graduate program committee for um, all of our graduate programs that are administered for our department. Um, and so many of you are aware that there has been this ongoing discussion about the role of the graduate record examination or the GRE um, in admissions decisions. Um, and our faculty in the past year, um, through a process, through a discussion that I led, um, decided to remove the requirement of the GRE um, in, in admissions decisions. And the reason for this is that um, when you look at the evidence, there's um, actually a lack of evidence that the GRE uh, provides meaningful, um, a meaningful measure of the likelihood of student success um, in graduate education. And, and more than that, it, it presents um, both a um, financial burden to students that are looking to go to graduate school, as well as um, a cultural and um, uh, and a barrier to those that have been historically underrepresented and underserved um, by the sciences and um, by graduate schools more generally. Um, and so we are moving more towards a holistic, uh, what's called holistic review. And I, I indicate for those of you that, that play a role in your graduate programs at your institutions, um, there's a document here that was developed by the Council of Graduate Schools on holistic review. Um, I'd really like to highlight this as particularly a, a potentially positive way forward to develop new um, admissions guidelines and um, practices that is particularly helpful in the context of critical zone science. Um, because of the interdisciplinary nature of CZ science, um, there's often folks that are coming to graduate schools from programs that are different from the programs they're seeking to enter. Um, and in addition to that, um, the interdisciplinary nature of CZ science is such that, um, you know, we need to evaluate um, and, and help facilitate a discussion um, and an evaluation of, of how students um, respond to, um, to new challenges um, and to articulate and reflect on, you know, what they're bringing to the table in terms of being able to, um, you know, respond to, to new situations and new science um, and articulate in the past, you know, some some circumstances in which, you know, they have really kind of leveled up, um, and and not just in an academic sense, right? So um, holistic review sort of reaches out and asks, for instance, um, you know, identify a time in which you've overcome adversity, right? And and that could be a really good predictor of of your likelihood for success in graduate school, whether or not that was um, adversity in an academic setting or some other setting that, um, that has shown that, that you, know, you are a resilient person and are deserving of, um, of you know, a, a place in, in the critical zone science network. Um, I will just tell you that our preliminary data has indicated that um, removing the GRE requirement has had a tremendous impact on um, applications. So we've seen a five-fold increase in the number of PhD applicants, a three-fold increase in the number of MS applicants. And so I think that this has been a really positive thing um, and we're just sort of getting started. Um, as an educator, I'm very passionate about computational competencies. And, you know, as, as you might imagine, CZ science is something that is very computationally and data driven. Um, and so uh, we are developing a group here on campus um, have started what we call the Inclusive Computing Initiative. And this is an interdisciplinary group of people from across campus. So material scientists, geoscientists, geophysicists, engineers um, that are working to use evidence-based practices to um, both enhance the computational skills of in particular graduate students at Boise State, but also to provide them um, a supportive environment in which they can develop their own professional identity as computational scientists. Um, and also sort of underscoring the idea that 
there are universal kind of themes um, across these perspectives, um, across these disciplinary perspectives in things like diffusion and um, data management and um, visualization that, that are kind of useful threads that run throughout and provide this really nice kind of um, locus point for interaction uh, between and among students. The last thing that I want to mention, and this is something that I think has just been becoming, um, you know, something that's more, um, that I'm more passionate about, and that is acknowledging that um, as critical zone scientists, um, we are almost always doing our work on stolen lands. Um, and that's obviously a tremendous human tra tragedy, um, uh, and, you know, the legacy of which continues to this day in a number of, a number of ways. Um, I think that as well, um, we also have to acknowledge um, that secondarily, that's also a tremendous science tragedy, right? So there was a lot of traditional ecological knowledge in these landscapes that was lost by removing people from these lands and forcibly moving them to reservations. Um, and so I would love to see um, in the future us broaden sort of the critical zone research network to think um, more about how we can be inclusive of, of native voices and of native understanding of landscapes um, and, and not to just pay lip service to that, but to actually reach out to, for instance, our colleagues um, in, the, in the anthropological sciences and the social sciences um, to, to bring those voices more into the landscape and sort of help reconnect the, the landscape, um, the CZ science with kind of the, the um, the uh, understanding of the of, uh, traditional population. So, um, and with that, I think that I will pass it on to um, the next uh, speaker. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Leho. That was a great presentation. Um, Rick, are you able to share your screen and put forward your slides or should I um, present your slides for you? Rick, can you hear me? Is there any chance you're on mute, Rick? I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah, maybe we'll move to Kyle and then we'll come back to Rick and we'll try to figure it out. Okay. We'll keep working on this, Rick. Maybe Julia can help if you have any suggestions behind the scene. Um, Kyle, would you mind um, sharing your screen? So our next speaker is going to be Kyle Blount from the Colorado School of Mines. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I am really excited to be here today, uh, mainly to listen and learn from the other panelists and any discussion that happens later. Um, I love having conversations. Um, so my content is going to be perhaps a little bit more high level. Um, I was asked to represent an LGBTQ plus perspective on inclusion and for simplicity and time, I will be using queer as a term uh, to represent the group at large for the rest of the talk. And I'll talk a little bit uh, in a second about that. Um, but a little bit about me. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate in hydrology at Colorado School of Mines. I work with Terry Hogue, um, and I've done a little bit of research on post-wildfire hydrology, um, but most of my work right now focuses on using remote sensing to evaluate irrigation in urban landscapes and to inform uh, urban water conservation and the integration of uh, land use and water planning in uh, Denver currently. Um, so my experiences with D, I, and A, or E, all of the words, um, but with diversity and inclusion, um, really started when I was undergrad at AM. and um, I remember the student senate uh, attempting to pass a bill. Well, they did pass it, the president vetoed it. Um, while I was there, um, that removed funding from the, the resource center for LGBT students on campus. Um, and I can remember feeling very alone during that experience um, and very unwelcome uh, in that environment. And so that is what that experience, that understanding and acknowledging that I still have an insane amount of privilege as a white cisgender man who doesn't have 
any disabilities. Um, I can only imagine what that experience can be like for other people um, who do have intersectional identities. And so um, I think that's really important to keep in mind. During my time at Minds, um, I've been very involved with OSTEM, which is the queer organization on campus. I've also served as a peer mentor for, uh, I've been here four years now. Um, and I've also been very involved on the President's Council uh, for Diversity, Inclusion, and Access, which was formed to develop recommendations and start implementing some of these initiatives on campus. Um, and I'm currently what is essentially the Vice President of the uh, Student and Postdoc Com Committee on Diversity and Inclusion with the Research Center that I'm a part of. Um, so again, because of my experiences and understanding that I have only experienced a small taste of what some people do, um, I've made being involved in these types of initiatives and trying to make academic spaces in particular more inclusive, a huge part of my graduate experience and hopefully the rest of my career. Um, so the first thing I wanna present, maybe a little theoretical, um, but just want to dispel this idea that inclusion is a binary. I know there's a lot of text there. Really what's important is that it's a spectrum, right? So we go from explicitly marginalizing to explicitly inclusive. Um, but I don't think any space really exists in uh, you know, either extreme. Um, there are parts of our environments that are both inclusive and exclusive. And the goal would be to continually be moving towards an explicitly inclusive space. Um, so I would encourage us to think about the spaces that we're in along that spectrum and how can we go towards being more explicitly inclusive, obviously re reducing any behavior um, that is marginalizing, but then also being intentional about the way that we approach our involvement so that we are explicitly being inclusive for the other people involved. Um, so I had a hard time deciding what to talk about. So I'm gonna talk about pronouns, pronoun buttons, how to approach all of that. Uh, hopefully somewhat briefly. Um, if you're not familiar with why they're important, right, they communicate our gender identity, which is a, an integral part of who we are as people. Um, and so it's really important that we show respect for other people and how they identify and how they experience life. Um, and so knowing and using the correct pronouns for a person is just one way to be explicit, explicitly inclusive in any space that you're in. Um, and I will say, though, I exist mostly in academic spaces. I think most of the things I'm gonna talk about apply really anywhere, uh, daily life, um, if you're a professional, if you're an academic. Um, so the first ones there are some examples, um, you know, he, him, his, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs. Um, and those are obviously great, um, but having those predefined categories is maybe not always the best. Um, so if you are planning or uh, involved in planning an event, I would encourage you to think about how to maybe give more options. Um, the ideal would be to have blank pronoun pins that people can write on themselves. Now, obviously, that can be misused. And if you're in a large meeting or large conference, you don't necessarily want to have to deal with any of those issues. Um, so that's obviously an issue. Um, if you do are going to a meeting and you don't know whether or not they're going to be pronoun pins, you can always do what I did in the middle picture there, which is put your pronouns um, in your, your nickname. So that's my name tag from AGU uh, this past year, um, or just write them in on your name tag. That's fine as well. Um, or at the very least, give an option that's none of the above, right? Ask me about my pronouns, uh, just to indicate that that's important. Um, so I would say these things are more implicitly inclusive. Um, and I, again, I wanna push us towards being explicitly inclusive. Um, so I think a couple of thoughts on that. One, I try and use they, them pronouns until I know for sure uh, how someone identifies. I just think that's generally good practice. It's hard to do. I don't always do it, right? It's, we're very conditioned not to operate in that manner. Um, but if you can work on doing that, I think that um, creates an acknowledgement and a space for people to actually tell you how they identify before you uh, place your perception of their gender on them. Um, let's see. I have some notes so I wouldn't go off track. I could say a bunch of things. Um, <clears throat> okay, looks like I was muted there for a second. 
Uh, the other big next step uh, is that it's important that we verbalize these things too. Um, so it's not just a pin that you wear, it's something that you say, it's a part of how you introduce yourself. Um, and so I was at a meeting last week and I have to admit it was really uncomfortable. Out of the room of 30 people, we all introduced ourselves individually. I'm the only person who indicated my pronouns um, and really in a fairly mindful group of uh, social and environmental scientists. Um, but it's really important that we normalize saying these things out loud um, to make it safe for people who do identify as genderqueer, non-binary, or trans to be able to say their pronouns and not automatically be identified or outed um, for that identity. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, the next thing, language really matters. Um, the language that we use does matter. I think pronouns are a great example of that. On the note of pronouns, one of my soapboxes um, is I would like everyone in the world to stop using the phrase preferred pronouns, right? Um, their personal pronouns are just pronouns. It's not a preference, right? That's someone's identity and being respectful of other people shouldn't be optional. Um, so a little bit of soapbox there. Again, I said I'm going to be using the term queer. Um, that has been used derogatorily in the past. Um, I would argue that the community at large has really reclaimed that and been able to use it in a positive light. Um, I still use LGBTQ plus in more formal settings. Um, but that's a personal preference. Um, and then something that I learned recently, and I'm hopefully someone else can weigh in um, on this, but the term minority versus minoritized um, was a really interesting par paradigm shift for me, right? That, that disadvantage or the lack of privilege is a result of social systems, not the result of a personal identity. Um, so even just changing small pieces language like that, um, I, I personally think are incredibly important um, to acknowledging um, the social systems that exist and to kind of breaking down those barriers to inclusion. Quick note about intersectionality. Um, I'm not going to talk about what it is, but I, you know, what it means for me is that it's really important that we are working together across our diverse identities, whether any one of us embodies intersectional identities, or we collectively as people who are be, trying to be thoughtful about diversity and inclusion, embody those identities. I think it's really important that we work together um, across these identities and are mindful and respectful of other people's identities when we have these conversations. And finally, um, just some thoughts about getting involved. Um, if you're at a university, almost all of your universities will have a safe zone training. I would really encourage you to take that. It's a great opportunity to learn. Um, you usually get the option of getting a little plaque if you have an office to put outside, um, you know, to indicate that you've done the training, um, you're interested in being supportive of uh, the queer community. Um, whether you're a student or faculty, I would encourage you to check out the, the student organizations on your campus. Um, so OSTEM is a good example. Um, often there are resource centers on campuses. Um, but those organizations all need faculty mentors. Um, they usually have meetings that they welcome anyone to show up to. So if you just want to go and listen and learn, it's a great opportunity. Um, and obviously, if you're a student, that can be a great resource uh, for you as well. There are more professional organizations. Uh, many of your campuses will have uh, diversity initiatives, um, and there are often ways to get involved uh, through those. Uh, our professional society, so for me, that's AGU, um, but many of them have committees that are devoted to this. Many of them are updating their codes of conduct, which is incredibly important, and you know, making it enforceable that there's some disciplinary action that can be taken against members who um, make spaces not welcoming and inclusive. Um, and if you're in more of a professional setting, um, there are often employee research uh, groups or ERGs that you can check out. Um, and my last big thing is have conversations, try and listen and learn from other people. We all have different experiences, and I, I think my favorite part about being involved in all these initiatives is getting to sit and listen to all of the wisdom that the people around me share. Um, so, you know, ask questions, be respectful, um, and learn to say thank you if you're corrected. It's a hard one for me. I don't like being wrong, um, but we can't improve ourselves and we can't improve our contributions if we don't get corrected when we mess up. Um, and so, yeah, learn to say thank you. 
that, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, wow, this has been great. I'm just gonna keep us moving along. Aisha, are you ready to share your screen? Hi, yes. Okay, Hi. thank you. Our next speaker is gonna be Aisha Morris from the National Science Foundation. All right, let's see if I can do this correctly. I think that worked. Fantastic. Well, um, it has been awesome to, to sit here and, and listen to everyone's presentations and there's some fantastic programs um, and information that's been shared. So I hope everyone's taking notes as seriously as I am over here. Um, so my name is Aisha Morris and I'm a, a program officer at the National Science Foundation. I've been here almost a year and a half and my responsibilities are basically developing a human capital in the earth sciences. So um, my program is education and human resources in the division of earth sciences in the geoscience directorate. Um, so most people are probably familiar with NSF, but just a quick um, introduction. The mission of the National Science Foundation is to promote the progress of science. And to do that, we support uh, basic research and the development of people um, to create that knowledge that's gonna really transform the future. And yes, we know about the people or the research part, but it is really important and I really wanna stress the importance of um, really investing in people. And part of that is investing in broadening participation to ensure that everyone who wants to participate um, in the scientific enterprise, you could call it, um, is prepared and provided the resources and opportunities to do that. So NSF is the only federal agency whose sole mission is to support basic research. So this really is our um, bread and butter. Um, and we, we, NSF supplies the majority of all the federally finance, non-defense, and non-medical basic research awards to academic institutions. So again, most folks are probably familiar with NSF in that capacity. So um, that's a little bit of an introduction to why, uh, who NSF is and what we do. I think what I'd like to highlight now are the things that we're doing to really promote um, participation in the geosciences and in science in general, but today we're focused on earth science. So this slide has a whole lot of text, um, but I think there are some key things to note. This is really highlighting opportunities for students in the white text, and then there are a couple opportunities for faculty in the yellow box. So um, Christina Keating actually mentioned earlier the REU program. So that's one of the programs that I run, research experiences for undergraduates. And there are, I believe, over 500 different REUs at NSF. It might even be over 800. Um, in the earth sciences specifically, we have about 20 to 25. Um, but again, like Christina mentioned, there are, there are interdisciplinary opportunities. So you may find something that is addressing some of the more um, uh, human impact issues in critical zone science in the social and behavioral and economic sciences. So I would suggest you go to um, the NSF website so you can take a look and, and just search on uh, REU sites and then you can uh, start sorting through different types of opportunities. So what is the point of an REU? Well, REUs really aim to provide uh, a really valuable educational experience for undergrads um, through participation in research and per, uh, professional development. So our user designed to provide students with the opportunity to really hone those research skills, but not just research. We also want to see the development of students' um, professional and academic skills in terms of developing resumes, giving presentations, how do you talk about yourself and your science to those that you might be interested in engaging with, like a, a potential graduate advisor or an employer. Um, and so these are these are valuable experiences for students and they are, um, they are competitive, but there are so many out there and so many different uh, options for you to pursue. So I would encourage undergraduates um, 
And, and this is not just rising juniors or rising seniors. There are opportunities for students who have, uh, who may even be moving into, um, into undergrad, uh, early academic career students, students from community colleges, from di a diversity of academic institutions and academic levels. There are opportunities out there. So please take a look at the research experiences for undergraduates. Um, there are plenty of things for you to check out. And if you have questions about uh, our EU site program in particular, especially for the faculty, please feel free to reach out to me. And if it's not in Earth Sciences, I can help connect you with the uh, Cognizant Program Officer. So for our students who are graduating from undergrad and moving into graduate school, there is the Graduate Research Fellowship Program. This is an opportunity for students to, uh, to write an application to the National Science Foundation describing their personal goals for um, their careers, as well as propose a research project to do during graduate school. When students uh, apply to this, reviewers are actually looking to see, okay, we're investing in this person. And if we're investing in this person, um, are they making an argument that they're going to be someone who's going to make an impact in the field? So it's not strictly making an impact scientifically. That is important. It is also, are you going to contribute to uh, the scientific field? So these awards, uh, they're usually about 2000 per year, um, and it's across, again, across the foundation. These awards really recognize and support students who are outstanding graduate students. You can apply uh, a total of two times, but you can only apply once within the 12 months of graduate school. So especially for our students who are thinking about graduating and thinking about graduate school potentially next year, please do check out um, the Graduate Research Fellowship Program. And the, the link is listed on um, the web or on this slide here. Applications are due in late October, particularly for the geosciences, it's plus or minus two weeks, depending on which uh, directorate you're applying to. Uh, we also have an opportunity for students who are finishing a PhD, um, and the Earth Science Postdoctoral Fellowship is a program that's designed to provide uh, an opportunity for advanced training of postdocs, and it, it's really designed to support independent research for uh, postdoctoral scholarships. So it gives you the opportunity to go to an institution that's not your graduate institution um, and develop as an independent researcher and also get really, really effective mentoring. So we, it's not to just toss postdocs into um, a sink or swim situation, but it's to provide support, um, funding, and support for postdocs to really establish themselves and broaden their horizons. Um, the, the solicitation number is on the screen now, and if you're interested in a postdoctoral fellowship, just note there is often a theme tied to uh, that particular solicitation, and so um, right now the theme is scale. There may be um, some updates to the solicitation coming, so keep your eye on the website. So for our faculty, um, we do have opportunities for faculty to engage in broadening participation activities particularly um, programs such as NSF Includes. There is a planning grant opportunity. So if you're thinking about how can we do something at a larger scale, something more national, and you'd like to take some time to plan those activities, um, the NSF Includes solicitation might be worth taking a look at. So that's 19-600, and I know our time is getting short. So I use GeoPass as another opportunity within the geosciences for uh, faculty to apply, and there are three different tracks. You can um, do in, engage students in um, activities in informal networks, uh, in undergraduate preparation, as well as uh, graduate opportunities. So um, take a look at that solicitation as well. And I and I also would just like to emphasize uh, there may be more opportunities coming in the near future. So keep your eye on the NSF um, Geosciences website. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, Christina, are you ready to show, Christina Bandarogoda, are you ready to show your slides to us? Christina, are you there? Uh, oh, 
It seems like you may be muted. Okay. I think I'm all unmuted. Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, and time check, I, we have another presenter after me. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So I'll provide these slides for folks if you want to look at them more in detail. Um, I am a hydrologist. I work at the University of Washington as a senior research scientist. And so my work includes a lot of jobs, project type consulting jobs with tribes and local governments in the Pacific Northwest. And then part of my work is National Science Foundation cyber infrastructure type of projects. And cyber training is a new program that NSF has to train people how to use all of this amazing cyber infrastructure that's being built for all of us to use bigger data science toolboxes and do the complex modeling that we need to do for critical, critical zone research, especially um, including humans. We're scaling from humans to climate change. It gets complex, as you all know. So Water Hack Week is the cyber training program that we've got three years of funding for, and we've got our second year coming up. Uh, Christina, so did you I have your slides? I meant to, am I not? You're not sharing slides, at least I don't see anything. That's because you need to click the share button to make that happen. How about now? Yes. I was presenting to myself. And well, we could hear you and see you, so that was fine. <laughs> and this is what you would have seen. <laughs> so I would have shared it with you. Uh, it's just our uh, project details about our NSF project, which is a collaboration, um, also includes our, our partners from Quasi and other organizations. And we're like, looking to, to build our community of, of people who are participating. So Water Hack Week um, methods, you can read about this more in detail, but I just wanted to give an overview of the, the meta, meta scale of, you know, we have a lot of, especially focused on water, there's some global challenges coming up and currently that have been going on for a long time. And, you know, if, as I was looking through, going through and um, exploring the process of selecting applicants for our training program, really the global population and the distribution of the global population made me curious about what would happen if a room of scientists were working together to address global water issues and the population that was in the room represented the global population. We've never experienced that as a society before. Um, and so what we've done with our application selection process for Water Hack Week is to, to um, consider the needs for diversity to address these research problems are not, um, well, so the three categories, broadly speaking, there's about 45 different intersections of, of data that we get from the applicant. Um, but the main, the main three categories are the science diversity. So we've got these categories. Most of our applicants are familiar with river and stream types of data. And of course, meteorology and climate. Um, but we also we need a diversity of other science experience. Um, another category is, you know, using our rubric based essays that have to do with um, interest, like how we're trying to capture the passion and interest of wanting to learn pretty complex and new data science and cyber infrastructure skills um, by domain scientists so that they can advance the research. So this is the type of learning objectives that we've got from participants this year. Uh, and then the other factors that we include in our selection, it's the multiple objectives include all types of intersectional identity that we collect information about um, includes geographic as well as other categories that we're familiar with. Um, and there was a question by Wendy about age and I, I wanted to note that our what part of our um, diversity is of, along career stage. So we our target is to have about 50% PhD students 
Um, and then the other 50% of participants were looking for uniform distribution of, of all of their career stages so that we get the wealth of new ideas and experience um, along all career stages. And we've been successful at including faculty um, and senior you know, experienced faculty who want to improve their data science. Then um, the invitations I wanted to put out um, are how to get involved. <clears throat> we have a how to collaborate web page coming up. Um, our next four weeks is just in a few weeks, about a month. Uh, we work with an amazing um, independent culturally responsive education evaluator. So our program is an education program. And so NSF requires an education evaluator, which that was a whole new, as a hydrologist, I had no idea um, how to do that before. So there's a lot to be gained by working with an experienced person. You can find us on GitHub and on HydraShare and quasi um, cyber seminars from last year and for and this year. Last year's mainly interactive tutorials going through different toolkits and skills. And this year is more about panel discussions at the frontier of data science and cyber infrastructure that is being used for um, not only hydrology modeling, but also, you know, a range of critical zone computations. And these are our results from this year's applicant selection process. And it gives you an idea of, um, for a selected category um, that I thought would be of interest to you, uh, the global population um, are these lines here, which are our targets. Um, well, collectively, it's a target to have an intersectional um, learning community. And then this uh, last slide, if you want to dive into the details about our, our educational program and approaches, um, there is a, pop, a publication that came out last year about half weeks of an educational model. And we've been working really hard on the process of developing an application as well as um, algorithmically mediated diversity methods, which is all that multiple optimization um, techniques which you can call machine learning, but is um, really the biggest thing is to have a workflow that is really focused on inclusion during the event and developing an event where everyone feels included and then collecting enough data so you know where your gaps are in your recruitment and promotion so that you can, you know, spread the word that this is a, this is a type of education. This is a place and a community where everyone is included. Um, and to and then to do a better job with promoting. So that is um, what I have for today. Thank you so much, Christina. What I would like to talk about is uh, basically my experiences in uh, developing and running an accessible study abroad in the geosciences. And uh, before I talk too much about the study abroad, I just want to give a little sort of context uh, for our, our motivation in developing this. Um, so that the first, the first, uh, you know, principle that we uh, wanted to incorporate was the idea that inclusive geosciences uh, is accessible geosciences. And when I say accessible, I, I, I mean uh, disabled students. But in addition to that, you know, all uh, students really. Um, any background, uh, you know, uh, we have students that have dietary restrictions, students with different career goals, students with families, uh, students with jobs, you name it, uh, everybody uh, has a personal uh, circumstance. And so in trying to develop something that's accessible, uh, we, we, we think about frequently maybe physical access, but there are a lot of other aspects. And so that was sort of something that we wanted to uh, to, to delve into, and, and in, in part because of uh, the traditional geoscience curriculum contains elements that are inherently inaccessible, such as a uh, field camp. And so we wanted to develop a study abroad that uh, served as an alternative for students across the nation uh, to be able to participate uh, if uh, field camp uh, wasn't appropriate for them. And so uh, in thinking through how this might work, we sort of thought about, well, what are all the things in geosciences today that are accessible? And it turns out over the last decade, geosciences has really transformed. Maybe all sciences have 
you know, now we're talking about big data. We're talking about data science, machine learning, a lot of computational aspects. And some of the previous uh, panelists had, had actually mentioned some of those remote sensing, inclusive computing, um, you know, uh, data science. I think uh, Christina mentioned that in one of her slides. Um, and, and in addition to that professional development, I think Aisha also mentioned that. And so uh, it turns out uh, that these innovations in geosciences, new technologies that are available, open up a, a, a perfect opportunity for us to, as we uh, redesign our curricula, to, uh, to identify those aspects of geosciences that are widely accessible to all people. And so the message that we try to send in our class is that uh, no matter who you are, you can do cutting edge geosciences uh, using a laptop and an internet connection, whether you're in your office or you're sitting at a cafe sipping cappuccino in, in uh, the uh, Umbrian Apennines. And so um, this slide is just sort of showing some of the, the types of data that, you know, I personally use in my research and, and just sort of uh, the, the explosion in the amount of data that's happened recently. And so uh, the other comment that I wanted to make was about uh, applying universal design, uh, both for physical access and curricular access. And uh, I really wanted to make the point that you don't have to do this in isolation. Uh, probably on your campus, uh, there are uh, specialists in accessible, uh, access, uh, accessible course design uh, in, in and uh, you know, accessible practices uh, more generally, as if your disability resource center, perhaps some sort of office of instructional assessment or something. And if not at your university, there are others at other universities who would probably be happy to help. I know that uh, the disability resource center here on, on my campus at the University of Arizona uh, is frequently uh, being asked to travel uh, around the world really to help people uh, to develop more accessible options in, in their uh, organizations. Um, okay, so a little bit about the program. Uh, so we wanted to have something that uh, that uh, retained all of those aspects. So um, well, this this we can we can pass by this slide maybe to the last one now. So we wanted to uh, to have something that was modern that focused on those sort of data science, remote sensing kind of aspects of geosciences, but retained a lot of the character of field camp. Uh, the field camp experience. So the duration of the program is, is comparable, five weeks. The number of uh, credits that students get is comparable, six units. To, to make things as similar as possible, uh, in terms of those aspects of the program, you know, extended time with peers, extended time with faculty, immersion, uh, those kind of things that people have in the literature attributed uh, to field camp as being sort of transformational. But at the same time, focusing only on those aspects of geosciences that are as widely uh, uh, accessible as possible. And so our program is called the Accessible Earth, uh, has two meanings. One is that we're going to focus on accessible uh, geoscience uh, uh, strategies, uh, techniques, technologies. But uh, we're also making that we want to convey the idea that with a laptop and internet connection, you can uh, do cutting edge research in just about any corner of the globe from anywhere on earth. So um, I think that's about all I had to say. Uh, well, if there are any uh, undergrads, so the, the course is targeting uh, uh, advanced undergraduates and, and early career graduate students. The content of the course is very general. It's all of the things that uh, I feel like uh, incoming graduate students would benefit from knowing. Often I have incoming graduate students in my lab over the last 15 years that, you know, uh, had to get up to speed quickly to start doing some, some real research. And so I sort of noted all of those things that they come in uh, needing to know but weren't necessarily given as undergrads. And I, I put them all into this study abroad program. Um, what else? I think that's about all I had. Oh, the deadline was, yes, the deadline for applications for this summer, if anybody's out there is interested in learning more, uh, the deadline was yesterday for the applications, but if you contact me or the University of Arizona Study Abroad Program, I'm sure we could make an exception. And um, you could just Google Accessible Earth in Arizona, and it should pop right up. But if you have any trouble, uh, I, could, uh, I don't know how else you can contact me, but you, you should be able to find me. I'm, I'm Googleable. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rick. Do you run that program every year? 
Yes. Every summer, typically uh, uh, the last week of June through the end of July. It takes place in Orvieto, Italy, tiny hilltop village. It's very beautiful, uh, but it's also uh, accessible uh, for, for students with disabilities, that is, and otherwise. Thank you. Kamini, should we, what should we do given the time? It's a great question. We are like way over time, which I'm so, I like, I could let this cyber seminar go on for like four hours. I'm so excited about this one, to be honest. And I am so thankful to our panelists for sharing their expertise with us. In the interest of time, I do think I should let people go. The Q&A that has come up, um, I think people have mostly been answering on um, online, which I'm super grateful for. Um, please feel free to contact us or our panelists. I'm sure they would be happy to talk to you about any of these questions at any time. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, we do have a website. I'll post it on the, um, the little chat link here. Please contact us if there's anything. We'll get all of the opportunities that were um, shared here by our panelists up online. Um, thank you guys. Julia, do you want to close this thing out? So I just wanted to thank everyone once again to all of our panelists throughout this entire webinar series. This has been an incredibly interesting um, series and I really appreciate everyone for putting it together and for their contributions. Um, I work at Quasi, I'm a communications uh, coordinator um, and outreach coordinator. And I just wanted to outline a couple other more opportunities to add at Quasi. We have a couple workshops uh, with deadlines coming up at the end of the week and at the end of March. Uh, we have our biennial colloquium, which is a conference in July. We also have another webinar, which is going to be a virtual town hall with National Science Foundation Hydrologic Sciences. Um, that'll be another opportunity to ask questions. Um, and so please feel free to tune in for that. Uh, we also have various grant opportunities. I know we're running out of time, so I would encourage you to sign up to our newsletter and check out our website. Uh, my email is also up there. Feel free to contact me with anything quasi-related or related to this webinar. I would be happy to share any remaining questions or questions that you think of later on um, with our panelists. Um, once again, thank you so much uh, for participating and for making this webinar so great. And I hope to see you virtually in the future. Uh, thanks so much to our panelists. Um, and this webinar will be posted on YouTube in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everyone.